Welcome, this is a recorded session of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Conference of the PKI Consortium. This conference would not have been possible without our sponsors in Trust, HID Global, and PQ Shield, and the organizational support of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Working Group of the PKI Consortium, in particular in Trust, Logius, TNO, and CWI. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> I hear your mic. Yeah. Okay. Well, oh yeah, now it's working. Yeah. It's Thank working. you. So yeah, good afternoon. Welcome back to the uh, last block of this uh, post-quantum cryptography conference of the PKI Consortium. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. We definitely did. Uh, it was great to organize this again. But luckily, we have not finished yet, because as you can see, we have a book work, a complete book of questions from remote participants, uh, from the chat, from forums that have been filled. And we will definitely not be able to answer all of them, I think. Um, but we also have a lot of people here in the room. And so I would definitely want to give everyone the opportunity. So we're going to mix it a little. Uh, we take a question from the room, maybe a question from, from remote, maybe new questions come in. Uh, that we can still uh, still answer. So uh, feel free to make this a very interactive session. Uh, this is the only slide we have. So <laughs> that's a good start, isn't it? <coughs> um, yeah. So Sorry. with that, uh, is there anyone who would like to start with a question? No? Come on. <laughs> you can do better. We've been like, asking questions all day. So well, think about it for a second. Albert. Oh, oh, oh. Bill. Well, where, where will the... Where will the third where will the third conference be? Where okay, well that, that that's, that's a good, a good one. Question. Where should the the third conference be? Uh, should it be uh, in Europe again? Should it be in the US? Uh, maybe in a Asian Pacific? Oh, Dubai. Well, sounds good. Any other uh, suggestions? I think a warm country, right? Thailand? <laughs> I haven't heard the Bahamas yet. <laughs> okay, Albert. Yeah. So, uh, of course, we got a, a, a question. Uh, I have a question uh, for Stephen Elon. I'm not sure he's in, available in the, in the room uh, at the moment, but uh, does the BSI consider making standards mandatory in Germany? I, I haven't seen Elon, but is maybe Elon someone else anymore? from the governance track or, or um, who wants to comment on this. Anyone? Anyone? No? Okay, Paul, next question. Okay, well, Bill, I have a question for you. Yeah. Are you prepared? I'm ready. Yes? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a long question, so I'm only going to read half of it. I hope fine. you understand it. But uh, is educating speculative investors in cryptocurrencies using quantum unsafe ECDSA, which is part of the quantum <laughs> threat, a priority <laughs> for the US government? <laughs> If you Google how many papers NIST has written about cryptocurrency or, or anything money-wise, there are very few, so I, I don't have an answer. Okay, well, that's an answer as well. Thank you. Um, so, Anita, I have a question for you. How to scan effectively for cryptography in use? Can you answer that question? Yes, I'm sitting over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, well... I think uh, right now we can't. Yeah. We have some vendors who have some tooling and can, can do it in s at some degree, but not uh, in the way we think we need it. So we're doing starting this project in defining what we think there is necessary on characteristics of cryptography you have to know and then ask the vendors to build it. Because we think that the whole world needs a lot of tooling for crypto inventory. So auto discovery isn't that easy. It's, it's not easy at all. All right, no. thanks. That's actually something we've heard more often in the, uh, um, can I have a mic? Um, what we have heard more often in the PKI consortium where people are saying, well, uh, a lot of vendors are reporting that um, you were wrong? Yeah. Yeah. Um, are reporting that um, you need to do inventory and auto discovery. But actually, how are we going to actively implement this in, in our enterprise organization, uh, which is like 
significantly bigger or more complex than, than the average, and scanning is not that easy. Well, right. uh, it, it's not just a technical problem, it's also a security problem. If you open your door to scanning, then you uh, add a, new, uh, a possible new attack factor. So uh, it's also uh, important not to just solve the technical uh, problem of what to scan, how to scan, but also make sure that, uh, that it can be run safely. Running safely, that, that would be good, yeah. I think a uh, good addition to that. Yes, Tom? Sorry, I just uh, wanted to add to that. Um, we, we've seen in the US government uh, market uh, now that they are funding now for the scanning phase of quantum security, uh, that that's become a very big issue. Some of the U.S. government networks are much more complex than anything we see in private sector or anywhere around the world. And so we, we actually are seeing not only good tooling companies come up, as, again, just as, as you would say, but we're seeing a great willingness for those tooling companies to evolve with the requirements so we work with, with there's a spin out from Google called Sandbox AQ that is, has been really good at evolving their product. I think it started as a French product, but it keeps evolving and evolving with, it, with every new client we get. And I do think as an industry, we'll get there. And, and to your point, yeah, having a, a trusted provider do that and not just downloading a tool from the internet uh, is, so, is critical. So, uh, a question, uh, uh, Ronald, uh, specifically for you. Uh, you mentioned about the security risk, right? Because you can do auto discovery, but what kind of new security risk do you expose if you use those tools? I mean, if you use NetMan account, right? Uh, what, what kind of... Uh, these scanning tools uh, could potentially also scan for other stuff, not just the cryptography, maybe look for vulnerabilities in your system, or also maybe the absence of certain security measures. So, uh, you know, uh, I I at the hands of, uh, of, of malicious parties, uh, anything can happen when you run software that cannot be trusted. Thank you. Yeah. Back. Anita? Yeah, it, it's on, or it should be on. Well, talking. well we and uh, I want to add something uh, to that. Because uh, not only the security risk is risk, yes, you but, but you can manage that with uh, demands that you uh, uh, add. But also, uh, not only the owners of uh, infrastructure does want to have sensors or agents in their security because they're uh, um, they're anxious because business continuity uh, may be uh, at stake there. So they're very afraid that it influences the business continuity. So they're, they're not willing too much to about having agents or sensors in their uh, surroundings. So it has a huge impact. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I have another question over here. No, no, no. Uh, I, I, was uh, I, I wanted to dwell on this topic. Okay. And, and it is that in fact, what we are identifying is that the fast way to to create an inventory is use the the vulnerability uh, scanning tools that normally big enterprises have already. So that's a a way for for having a, a first round of inventory. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, that that's great. Before we 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 continue with the the uh, the audience here. We also have a question from, from remote, and I think this is in a question for Greg. Um, so you free up budget. Albert, can you give the mic to Greg? Greg, You yeah, free sure. up budget to implement hybrid. Uh, your systems change accordingly. Your risk is fully addressed. How do you obtain more budget to fully remove classical? Interested in your thoughts on organizations staying in a hybrid still for maybe longer than expected? Or thoughts on how we weight up the decision of going hybrid first versus going directly to PQ only? Or does this uh, rely on crypto agility and protocols, products, etc.? And being able to move seamlessly between hybrid post-quantum only schemes without a big chance change. Uh, but then what will come first? The required crypto agility, trusted PQ, or that of classic? That's a very long question. Sorry yeah, for that. I, I think I got <laughs> the sense of the question. I think the sense of the question really is, can we afford multiple transitions? That if you start with a hybrid scheme uh, for the next few years, and then um, 
you know, turn off the traditional cryptographic layer uh, at a point in time where you're fully confident, um, do you pay the price twice? Um, I would say the advice I give to my uh, customers and organizations I talk to really is to use this opportunity, this transition to post-quantum, to build a mature capability in your organization to manage your cryptographic assets. Um, build in the visibility, build in the policy and compliance, <laughs> build in the automation so that um, the next transition you make is a seamless and, and automated and policy driven one. Um, I think, you know, Dustin talked about the, uh, the, the current NIST process potentially isn't the end of this uh, quantum safe journey. That over the course of time we may end up with um, uh, adjustments or improvements or additional algorithms that in certain situations we want to take advantage of. And so building that cryptographic agility, building that mature capability to manage cryptographic transition in an automated way, really take this opportunity now to build that. Um, so that then the, the transition away from a hybrid scheme is potentially just a policy driven uh, automated process um, because that's what you built to begin with to transition to post quantum. Okay, thank you. Any comments from the room? No? Thank you, uh, Greg. Um, so I have another question from, from earlier of the, uh, the remote here is uh, creating our, where this is for the governance panel. Um, so, cr and anyone else who wants to answer, but creating awareness is one thing. Uh, how do NIST, BSI, and the Dutch government create a sense of urgency? Who wants to take this? How are we creating a sense of urgency? Do we need to create a sense of urgency? <laughs> I, I described that we had a sense of urgency on the federal government created by a memo and, and I think for some, they, they, they absorbed it and they said, ooh, I have a new task, it's exciting, it's interesting, and they agreed with what they had read about Shor's algorithm and the threat. And then for others, they said, kind of, I've got other things going on, what the heck is this? And so I don't, it's, it's an interesting balance because if you put out a memo a year ago that said do zero trust, and then you say this memo, and it goes to the same person, and they didn't get any more money to do any of these things. That urgency is is dampened. So, it's a it's a tricky question. I think we can recover from these things and 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 get to a good place. But I think Jermaine has a, a better answer. Well, actually, I don't know if it's a better answer. Um, but what you need to do is to adjust your message to the audience. You know, for government, it is like, uh, why are we on Earth? It is to provide uh, a safe environment for our citizens, for example. So if you tell uh, government officials or like managers or directors in that space, then you have to uh, attach it to that mission you have. And if you then add some beautiful pictures, then uh, yeah, you will create some awareness. <laughs> nice. Okay, we need to create pictures. I, yeah, pictures of all. <laughs> well, look at our pictures here. It's gone. Oh, <laughs> all right. Dustin, I have a nice we have question a, for you. We have you. a question also from the audience. A question yeah. for the audience. Fekke. Yeah. Sorry? Yes, that one. I'm not going to throw this one there, Fekke. If that one hits my head, I have no problem. <laughs> Okay, I want to elaborate on this uh, question. It's not only the technical part, how to implement uh, uh, post-quantum crypto. For signatures, for instance, you need to do the legal part, the legislation part as well. So it needs to get uh, a formal status. And for that, you need to do some other kind of investigations. For instance, in the qualified uh, signatures of EIDAS, you have to use protection profiles. And as far as I have heard here, the, the side channel attacks of post-quantum uh, post crypto can be quite different than the standard uh, uh, signatures. And I would like to know what the United States of America and the European are doing to make uh, to be ready for post quantum signatures, I don't know who Any can answer this question. Any comment on that? Yes. 
I, I think it depends a lot on what you're talking about because this is true when you talk about signing documents using electronic signatures, but we use signatures a lot for authentication and those kind of purposes. And there, uh, I just think people need to get started uh, and, and get going. And, and we can talk strategy, we can talk legal, and those things are very important. But uh, I run into a lot of, like, especially smaller companies and smaller organizations that are spending months and months to gather teams and gather information. And I, I, I understand it. But I also want to say, just get going and just start doing something because the truck service providers that are relying oh, on having hey, common here, truck service. Here, the microphone. Uh, it's a very big problem in Europe because here, under the IDAS legislation, trust service providers who deliver services that are for qualified electronic signature, they rely on protection profiles, which were decades old. They're actually for secure signature creation devices. They've been kind of adapted for qualified electronic signature, but none of these are basically being updated for taking into account any of the new signature schemes for PQC ready. So this is really, there's this kind of lag where Hardware developers like NXP or Infineon or you know, HSM manufacturers want to be able to certify under these schemes, but it doesn't seem that new protection profiles are being actively adopted and that they're lagging behind even the, the kind of standards that are coming from. So th this seems to be very aligned with one of the questions we actually received for the governance panel, uh, which is, have you taken into account um, uh, European uh, new regulations about the digital identity, such as EIDAS? And we've seen the presentation from uh, uh, Lizzie Pullman uh, about EIDAS and, and what we're doing. Um, maybe that has answered the question. Anyone, Lizzie, do you want to answer this? Or maybe someone from the governance panel? Comment? Bill? Yeah, Bill? Yeah. Um, well, it, it strikes me you just identified a tactic, which is to ask an organization what regulations, what laws, what, what, what are the drivers and bring this quantum question into the organization and don't let it stop at the CISO's shop, but let it stop at the at the mission and business part of it where these, more. People, these people know how they're being affected. Yeah. And then that's when you say this regulation matches something you need to do and that creates urgency, I hope. So that, that's a tactic I haven't really heard. We, we don't have a lot of worked examples. So I, I, I think the bringing back worked examples of this happening will teach others. So it's not only a technical part, is what you mentioned, uh, Bill. Yeah, thanks. I have a question for Dustin. Uh, Dustin, um, for NIS in the immigration plan, are you uh, suggesting a hybrid algorithm or just post-quantum algorithm? So NIST isn't really saying you should do hybrid or you shouldn't do hybrid. We will accommodate it. We already have one standard that shows how you can do a hybrid key establishment. Um, so we think it's going to be more up to the protocols and applications to decide if it's right for them, and we will help people to do it, but it, we're not going to require it or make anybody do it or not. We heard a lot of feedback from industry that it makes sense. Certainly it makes sense to us as well. So, Any comment on that? Well, yeah. I have a qu Over there? Oh, keep it, keep it. Um, one, one thing that I see a bit coming up is that uh, there will be a bit of a problem if, for instance, uh, in an HSM or whatever, you have uh, schemes that, that, that do hybrid or, or uh, something like that, and um, uh, there is a standard missing, there is no standard explicit for it, uh, then it can uh, be the case that, that libraries or, H or hardware uh, devices can actually do something different. And what I'm a bit afraid of is that every protocol will have its own hybrid kind of cryptography and no libraries will be compatible with each, each other. Um, so th that's uh, one of the things that I, I'm seeing a bit as a problem. So I think in the end we need some kind of standardization uh, effort fr coming from somewhere. And I, I don't see, at the moment I don't see where this standardization is coming from because in the end, uh, implementations are built on protocols and protocols are built on schemes and this whole stack needs to be present before a, a product can move on and can be can be created so you can set, say to a, to a company okay please update to post quantum cryptography but where are the standards um, and where are the protocols 
uh, that they need to implement. Greg? Yeah, so I, yeah, I can answer great. that uh, a little bit. There is, in fact, uh, quite a bit of work going on to standardize uh, hybrid or composite forms. Um, just this week right now in Prague, there's the ITF. There's a post-quantum hackathon there. Um, different groups have brought their implementations of composite to that event and are testing interoperability as we speak. There are a couple of different IETF drafts, um, the Unsworth composite uh, keys and composite signatures draft. There's one for open PGP. Dustin referenced one for hybrid key exchange and TLS. There's definitely standard protocol mechanisms that are being built today as we speak that I think will generate the compatibility and the compliance that you're looking for for um, different hybrid schemes. Okay, thank you. I well, I heard there is a remote question, Paul. Yeah, actually, uh, in, in, in a similar direction as, as uh, the, the previous uh, question or comment, um, it's a not sure who to ask, so, but maybe Greg, as you're replying, maybe uh, you could comment on this. But um, we long relied on uh, PKCS, uh, public key crypto cryptography standards, as the technical specifications that make PKI possible. How do you think these cryptographic libraries will be updated or replaced when quantum computer computing is commercialized? Will mostly all be obsolete outright? Examples, the ones related to RSA, or will they likely be updated to reflect the new use of cryptography? Yeah, so the, so I, the question, I, as I interpreted it, is, is how are the crypto libraries that our applications built on today going to change over time? Uh, and I th they're 100% they're going to change, and, and likely fairly rapidly. Um, most implementers that I'm aware of are, um, are waiting for the NIST standards process to finish before they put um, sort of commercially available um, PQC into their crypto libraries. Um, again, many vendors are exposing early adopter capabilities in their cryptographic libraries and, and HSMs and PKI applications so that um, customers can try in their labs post-quantum before the standards come. Um, but I suspect that it'll be a bit like this, you know, the starter's gun at the beginning of a marathon. When the NIST standards are finally ratified and available, um, mm -hmm. vendors are going to quite rapidly, I think, expose um, standards-based uh, PQC in their cryptographic library. So I expect to see it in, in the Windows platform, in the Linux platform, and in the different implementations, open source implementations of cryptographic uh, libraries, and in, in vendors like Entrust and, and all the other vendors that you've heard from today, this week. Um, the question was when a commercial, part of the question was when a commercial uh, scaled quantum computer is available, how is that going to affect uh, cryptographic libraries? I think the whole theme of this conference has been we as a as an industry and, and the, our connected digital infrastructure has to have moved from traditional crypto cryptography to quantum safe before that happens. Uh, because it's too late at the point when a scaled quantum computer is, is available. Um, so hopefully, well before that happens, the traditional cryptographic primitives like RSA and elliptic curve are you know, relegated to deprecated state and uh, organizations for the most part for their critical information have moved to quantum safe. So we need to act now, right? You bet. <laughs> okay, well, I have another question uh, from, from the remote audience, and uh, this one is for, for Dustin. Um, Dustin, uh, does NIST plan on, on updating anytime soon the current recommendation for RSA, which, is, which still recommends RSA basically indefinitely until 2030 and beyond, without specifying it further? This recommendation could uh, convey a false sense of security and incorrectly suggest that PQC adoption is not very urgent if RSA is still recommended without an end date, for example, BSIs. Yeah, our, our, some of our other standards and guidelines, some that have timelines, they will be adjusted. They have to have first the PQC standards published because we can't deprecate RSA if there's nothing else to move to. So. After the standards are published, we will have other updated guidance and timelines that come out um, pretty promptly after. They won't be immediately at the same time, but yeah, they will be updated and those public key algorithms will get timelines for deprecation and, and so forth. Okay, 
Thank, Thank you. you. Well, we're almost running out of time. Yeah. Um, Going quickly and for a the, lot uh, of questions. Starting to the next, uh, <laughs> next session. Are there any remaining questions from the room here? Okay, well, do we have a mic? Yeah. Very simple one, mainly towards uh, government officials, EU related, sorry. Um, can GDPR help us in enforcing uh, moving to PQC as it requires uh, uh, taking into account the state of the art to protect uh, privacy related data? Well, uh, it's on. It, uh, yes. Um, uh, yes, you should stay use state of the art, but NIS. Uh, it also helps because Na NIS says you have state you have to use state of the art encryption. So uh, all the sectors and uh, who, uh, who are uh, part of NIS they have to move on because there's not a lot of uh, lines that give enough answer to that that you have to start now. Well, that is very clear, and uh, in indeed we have a lot of regulations in Europe. Um, I'm not sure uh, how this would work in the US or uh, if there's any driver for that, but GDPR in combination with NIST and uh, the other fundamental uh, uh, regulations uh, would, would definitely be applicable here, uh, at least in, in my opinion. Um, Albert, what do you think? Shall we uh, ask the uh, chairs of the individual sure. sessions we had over the past few days on stage and join us here um, for uh, the key takeaways uh, before we conclude the uh, the conference uh, in about half an hour and uh, join each other with, with some drinks and some, some time for networking, uh, which is maybe even the best part of this entire conference, <laughs> talking to each other. Um, sure. So thank you. Please come on stage, <laughs> all the, uh, the chairs. Yeah. In today's complex, fast-paced world, you need a partner who can help secure your digital transformation so you can drive your business forward confidently. Someone who can fine-tune and integrate the secure technologies that enable mobile identities, digital payments, and a hybrid workforce. You need a partner who will have your back so you can stay focused on the road ahead and accelerate your organization's growth. Entrust, securing a world in motion.